So when we talk today, our talk today is about working with the, uh, I hate to call it elderly. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but I'm to the point now that I think anybody over 22 is a senior citizen in sports and in collision sports and in collision occupations. You can argue with me all you want. Uh, call me in five years and we'll talk again. So what I have up here is fit. Fit means to knit, to be knit. That's, the, that's where the term comes from. And I argue this for everybody I work with. If you have six pack abs, but your children and grandchildren can't stand you and won't come to your house for Christmas, in my worldview, you're not fit. If you lose your spouse because you're trying to do something, uh, run a tough mutter, and she says, you're not doing that again, and you lose your family, in my worldview, you're not fit. Now, I know I'm a bad person by saying this, but I really believe in my heart. Fit is the ability to do a task, and that's all it is. If you run a marathon and win, but you have pancreatic cancer, you're fit to win a marathon, but you're not healthy. Health, according to Matthew Tone, is the optimal interplay of the organs. And if I was to argue, and I have many times in my career, the problem we have in our industry today is that a lot of people are trying to make fitness standards equate to health. In this room today, if you're between the ages of 25 and 55, and you don't smoke, and you wear your seatbelt, you'll make it to 55. Statistically in the United States, if you're 25 years old and don't smoke and wear your seatbelt, you survived to 55. Now sadly, I'm almost 58, so those numbers don't work. So one of the things I want to get across is we're at a golden time in health in the United States. <laughs> we better be because we spend a lot of money on health care. But our problem, I think, from guys like me on the fitness side, is we keep trying to pound in, boom, the hammer of weird standards, like you're healthy if you run a marathon. You know, you're healthy if you're on a triathlon. Well, that's not always true. So just keep that in mind. By the way, uh, last night's conversation with Bert and the gang, uh, TRX guys, uh, I added some slides. So some of the slides I'm going here today will look a little different. Is that a, if that's a problem, forgive me, OK? I've added some slides, all right? You OK with that? All right, sorry. I have this, that's me pointing at you. I have this book called uh, Intervention, where I, and I'm going to summarize the book so you don't have to waste your time buying it. But when I go, when I work with people, I ask three questions. Question number one is, what is your goal? Here's the problem with the track and field athlete. When you throw the discus 180 feet, Coach Mon walks up to you and says, well, what's next? And you say, I want to throw 190 feet. He goes, that's a good goal. How do we know if we're on the path from 180 to 190? Well, if I throw 183, we're doing the right thing. You guys, okay, this is so frightfully obvious, but you're going to miss the point. If I throw 187, we're doing the right thing. We added deadlifts, and I went to 190. Well, deadlifts helped me throw 190. I represent, track and field athletes represent probably 0.00001% of the people you'll ever deal with in your life. I used to think most clients were A to Z clients. They come in, they sit down, they go, and I go, what's your goal? I want to look like the girl on the cover of Shape magazine this month. <laughs> Especially when Bert said that last night. I was like, that is weird. <laughs> I, but with enough Photoshopping, we can do anything. And I honestly thought that that covered the bulk of people that I need to learn to teach them intermediate goals. So I started talking to sports psych people, and they said, no, that's not true at all. And then I started talking to military recruiters. There's a sign in the Navy office that says, join the Navy, see the world. 18-year-old boy is given a choice, you know, either join the Navy or you go to prison. So the boy's sitting here in front of you, you're the recruiter, and you say, why do you want to join the Navy? Uh, see the world. Most clients you work with now, we call them A, not A clients. If you're the best fat loss person in Orlando, when they come to your gym, you say, what do you want, man? They'll say, uh, I want to lose fat. No, most clients tell you this. You see the person right here? This isn't who I am. See this guy? I'm 100 and, 
You know, I, I think of myself still as a 204 pound college discus thrower with a fast 40 and big lifts. I can't believe sometimes I look in the mirror and there's this guy who's got this stuff in his hair here. I keep trying to, you know, dust it away. So that's number one. With most of the clients you have, what comes out of their mouth has very little to do with what's back here. So I came up with an assessment system for this. Here's the goal of today. Always focus on what the client needs, not what they want. Now, if I have more time, I'll go through my system of how I convince people that what they want is also what I think they need, OK? So question number two, and this one's very important, but um, will this goal expand your life in better ways? Uh, one of my professors was a rabbi, and he said, when you're having struggles in your life, examine your prepositions. Who are you with? Who are you around? Who are you over? Who are you under? You know, those are your prepositions. And if the answers to all those are, I'm just by myself, you're going to have some struggles in life. I had about a seven year period of my life where I lived as a monk, basically. Uh, I didn't party, didn't do anything, and I trained to become the best discus thrower I could be. Did this expand my life? Yeah, all my education, my entire education, bunch of degrees, bunch of, a lot of stuff, travel the world, cost me $10 because they couldn't waive the health fee. So if I was to sit down with little Danny John when he was 13 years old and say, you're going to give up a ton of stuff, but trust me, long term, it's going to expand your life for the better in many ways. You follow that? Why do you want to have a six pack? Uh, it'll look good. That person's not going to get a six pack. They've got to have enough ideas in their head that they can, yeah, I can do this. And the final question is this, how old are you? Stunning statistic. 365 days from now, you're going to have the same conference. Each of you will be one year older. No, seriously, you can look it up and do the math when you get a chance by yourself. Weirdest thing I've noticed in my life, we're talking about it today. My, we're just, just Bert and I were talking in the hall. In 1965, my dad and my uncles would talk about World War II, and I get so bored because to them it was yesterday. This is 2015. If I talk about a track meet I had in 1995 or a Highland game in 1995, it seems like it was yesterday. Well, the years just keep clicking along, and every year you're going to get a little older. After whatever, I love this picture, by the way. I love this picture because I think it sums almost perfectly what's going on. After whatever age, and by the way, this is all you need to know. This is all I'm going to talk about today. You need to stretch what is tightening, strengthen what is weakening. Yonda taught, taught us this about polio victims. And what he said about polio victims is exactly true with an aging population. An aging, OK, let's do it this way. Most guys you know bench press, curl, and leg press. Yonda warned us that as we age, our pecs, our biceps, our hip flexors, and our hamstrings tighten. What did I just turn myself into? A very old man. Most guys training age them. We need to stretch those. Strengthen what is weakening. Number one. Number one sign of age, I think, is soggy, saggy bottom. Soggy bottom. I have had a total hip replacement a couple years ago. The saddest thing about it for me was I had gluteal amnesia. My left, I could not squeeze my left butt cheek. Now, that was a national treasure, people, and we were losing it. This is the, uh, <laughs> I joke sometimes when I give workshops, like, OK, I hate it when someone says, did you do cardio? I hate that phrase. I hate core. I hate, I hate all those words. Any word that your grandma uses, I, I hate. You know, did you do cardio? And I always say, no, but I did lymphatic. Because cardio is a system. If your heart isn't beating, that's a real problem, you know? So this morning, I got up and worked out my lymphatic system. Uh, man, I'm tired. That's a, man. Basically, your body is a collection of tubes inside of this nice little sack. You want to keep your tubes moving. And everyone just thinks digestion and elimination there. 
But if you've ever worked with someone who's had breast cancer, the old style where they used to cut the lymphatic system and they get the balloon arms. My mother, God bless her, before she died, had to wear this uh, very odd looking support because her arms exploded after, after the surgery because they shut off her lymphatic system. I mean, I was young, but I just remember, well, oh, that doesn't sound right to me. My goal in life is to live long and drop dead. Um, because I'm a theologian, God does tell you how you're going to die. In the year 2132, I will be shot to death, a sad story, by the jealous husband of a supermodel. But that's for another time. We'll just put that up. <laughs> scares me to think about it right now, so I just need a moment. And of course, which quadrant is this in? If you don't know my work, uh, a couple years back, Pavel Satsulin asked me a very famous question. He said, uh, what is the role of the strength coach? Eh, make people stronger. Perfect answer. I nailed it. What's the role of an English teacher teaching? Then he said, no, no, what's the impact? It took me the better part of three or four years to come up with it. And what I came up with this thing called the quadrants. And basically, I break up, the, uh, break up our impact on, as strength coaches into four areas. Quadrant four demands two things. It, it demands genetics and geography. This is the 100 meters, and maybe just like a deadlift specialist. Think about it this way. If Usain Bolt would have been born in West Texas, he would have been cut his junior year for not being tough enough as an outside you know, linebacker or wide receiver. But he grew up in a, in a country where sprinting is the national sport. You follow? Kid this tall, nothing but fast twitch muscle fiber. Put him in North Dakota, hockey player, right? Put him in Iowa, great wrestler. Put him in Bulgaria, world champion. So quadrant four, the 100 meters, the deadlift, I think the Olympic lifts, demands genetics and geography. And the truth is, most of us don't have the skill set to coach that level. I mean, honestly, let me tell you how to coach a sprinter. You, you take a gun and you point it at them. You say, on your mark, get set. You pull the trigger. And they run really fast. I, I think that's how they train them. I don't, I don't really know. Quadrant two is the problem. So in quadrant four, one or two qualities at the highest levels humans can possibly perceive. Quadrant two, OK, is the one that drives me crazy. This is the NFL. This is collision sports and collision occupations. I tell you one thing. I'm going to start putting on my, all my books, uh, uh, you know, invented by a Navy SEAL. Intervention, invented by a Navy SEAL. Because that will sell in the United States right now. Because every single 52-year-old man I know wants to do that thing he saw on TV called ultimate fighting. Remember that when fighting was a, if you've never been punched in the face, you're not an ultimate fighter. If, I mean, if you've never been in a fist fight, think you can go, he, when, the first time someone punches you, like when the first time someone shoots at you, there's this moment, it's like, really? What? I'm a quality person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I pee on myself on events like this, but that's different. Quadrant two. Quadrant two, lots and lots of qualities at the highest levels human pro humans can perform. I always argue that a Navy SEAL is probably a B minus student, but in a hundred things. You follow? So that's pretty hard to do. That's pretty hard to do. To be an NFL uh, outside linebacker, you know, I'm three inches too short. At the Olympic Training Center, I ran a four set. They were doing this study of discus doors. So we remained to run 40 meters, uh, 40 yards. I ran a four seven fully automatic timed 40. It was two tenths of a second too slow to play outside linebacker in the NFL. I weighed 273. I mean, come on. These guys are freaks of nature, and there's tactics, and there's strategies. When you talk about uh, special operations guys, they have to be able to handle, to say, dozens of different weapon systems. They have to be able to drive a vast array of vehicles well. They have to be able to, you follow my point? And yet, your neighbor Bob wants to train like a Navy SEAL. <laughs> the same guy who can't mow his lawn, wants to have the discipline to train. Yeah, OK, you got the point. Quadrant one, lots and lots and lots of qualities at a very, very low level. That's the importance of high school and pre-high school physical education programs. Do not come to my house on the Super Bowl and say, how many is that? 
You should know the rules of every major sport. You should know how to play most sports. Doesn't mean you have to be good at them. I always joke about in, uh, when I was a sophomore, my basketball team, the endoplasmic reticulums, we won. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> you can tell. We won our our PE class tournament in basketball. I swear the score was four to two at the end of you know forty five minutes of play. We were terrible, but we were the best in that class. You, you, you follow? Quadrant three is where the bulk of the population is. And that's what I'm going to focus on today, because I'm going to make a very tough statement today. <laughs> I used to make fun of us. La uh, very few qualities at a very low level. But this, I argue, is how you train any aging athlete, any aging performer of any kind, and literally everybody else. So just to summarize, you probably will never have a quadrant four client. I mean, how many of you ever get phone calls from Usain Bolt? Hey, man, would you come on? I'm having a problem with, you know, right there at the 40 meter line. You know, I'm not accelerating like I used to. You know, uh, I, I, what would I tell him? Deadlift, I don't know. You know don't deadlift. I, can't, I don't know how to work with sprinters. You guys know how to work with, the, like, you know, my best deadlift is 628. The world record in my size now is 1,050 pounds. I mean, I don't know, you know, just, you know, uh, Pick it up. I, you know, what do you say? What do you, <laughs> when, when someone de deadlifts 990, I mean, what do, you, what do you say? I mean, what's, you know? You might work with football, rugby, or special ops people. You might. And many of you do. But still, listen to my point today. The little ones are in quadrant one. So basically, Q3 is active athletes, active operators over age 22. And what I call everybody else. After age 20 or so, you are in quadrant three. And there's two kinds. Now, what's cool about what I'm going to give you is that in the future, you can call up and say, Dan, I've got a Q3 E squared six, and I can't convince them to stretch. And I'll understand exactly what you just told me. So I'm trying to systematize how we discuss the general population and their needs. And I hope there's some value to that. Quadrant three, A squared. Quadrant three, active, uh, active athletes. From what I've seen from this weekend, this is the population you guys seem to want to work with. OK? The aging firefighter. The problem, does anyone work with aging firefighters? OK. Is there a problem communicating with an aging firefighter about their, what they need to do versus what they want to do? You follow? You follow? So that's what I'm trying to do today. And I'm going to give you a toolkit today at the end that you'll at least have, yeah, yeah, I know you want to bench press, but between sets of bench press, I want you to do hip flexor stretch. You follow? Because guys will bench press. Do you guys know how I program bench press and curls? Do you guys know how I program it? It's great. Write this down. Don't. I don't know of a male who doesn't do it. So why put it in? My discus throw Chandler, I'm leaving. What do you want me to do in the bench press? He, he just finished snatching and cleaning and jerking, and I sent him away. He goes, can I bench press? <laughs> yes. Coach, OK if I do curls? It's like, I don't, why are you asking? I know you're going to do it. It's like, don't put it in. They'll do it. Trust me. <laughs> and women with stretching and ab work, never program it. <laughs> never program it. They will do it. It's like, oh. It's okay we work our abs today? Oh, what a miracle. I've never heard that sentence. <laughs> Program the Q2 uh, Q3 athlete is this. Do the sport. Do the activity. And then in the gym, do the fundamental human movements with me. The best way to set, get someone ready for doing stuff over in, the, in our lovely countries we spend time in is to have them spend time in those countries and walk around with, it's supposed to be only 33 pounds, but it's always 85 pounds of stuff. Walk 10K. That's, that's a good workout. You don't need a treadmill after you just march 10K with 85 pounds on. You've taken care of your cardio. You've taken care of your lymphatic system is wired. You're fine. The second point is the killer point. This is the key. Our job is to address weaknesses. But I want to compete with our strengths. You know, when I was a discus thrower, I am a fast twitch monster. But 
That's funny because you guys know I was this close to being in the NBA? You guys know that? True story. Okay. That's, that's a joke. So we'll, we'll review. See, I was, yeah, there you go. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. I was going to show you how close I was going to be to a priest. But. Okay, now, as a fast twitch thrower, I couldn't beat all those guys who could throw with these long levers. So in practice, I practice long levers, but in meets, I try to explode, out explode everybody else. You follow? Address your weaknesses, compete with your strengths. And I think our military, when it does its best work, is when we have our guys who kick down doors and do bad things, kick down doors and do bad things. Not teaching preschool. Assessment. The title of my next book is called Can You Go? It's a phrase that every football coach has used in their life, you know, and every, uh, anyone who's ever worked with an adult population. You know, uh, this guy here, Bob, Bob shows up, he goes, I didn't sleep well last night. You know, the people next to me were, they'd gone out to this place and ate, didn't eat prime rib because they'd run out of prime rib, and these guys were complaining all night. And they drank wine, it seemed like, because they were loud and couldn't sleep. And I think I hurt my hamstring, and my, my, my inner fillet, uh, you know, Sally says, it hurt the cramps when I do. What, as a coach at the Nationals, you know what I say to him? Can you go? Because that's what it comes down to. And if you can't, you get left behind. I mean, I don't want, for you guys who are firefighters, <laughs> bring, bring, my house is on fire. <sighs> oh, yeah, we really had a hard workout this morning. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, my hamstring, so I think I might have pulled something, you know, right? You have a solemn duty to scramble out and help me out, right? Yeah, so, can you go is it. And if you tell the fire captain, you know, your, your leg is broken off, and can't go today, he'll go, okay, you know, someone step up. And that's it. So what did we learn so far? We just focus on two things when you are working with active athletes. And this is what I focus on. First and foremost, standards. I have standards for every sport I coach. Standards. And if you're not up to them, my job is to get you up to them. And that's part one. Part two is the hard part. What are your gaps in training? Uh, I just summarize strength training with the five basics and what I call the six moves. Push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Now I know other people, here's the problem. They will say vertical press, horizontal press. Do you guys know why that's a problem? I have yet to work with a male athlete who doesn't press enough, too, too much, ever. So by having two categories, for they're going to do 200 militaries, 500 bench presses, and a set of eight squats. So that, to me, is a gap. Push, pull, hinge squat, loaded carry. Loaded carries with the farmer walks, the prowlers, the predators, and I'm very happy to see them all the time nowadays in sport. When I started doing loaded carries, I was 46 years old, basically, the season before that. It was the single best discus throwing year of my career. If I would have started doing loaded carries when I was younger, I wouldn't have had that big swoon for about 20 years of my career. It's weird to say this, but at age 46, just adding farmer walks, sleds, and prowlers got me back to a, a, a national level as a discus thrower. Anyone know the problem with being a 46-year-old discus thrower? Is you have girls in high school. And prom is more important than the West Coast Relays. OK? I'm not saying prom is bad. I get to Stick a pin in a boy. And what I call the sixth movement is everything else, but honestly, it'd be mostly groundwork. If I could get people rolling, I'd be the happiest man in the world. At my age, is anybody at my age, you're post 50, anyone post 50 here beside me? Okay. In our age group, 28,000 Americans die from falls and fall related injuries every year. Here's an interesting thing I'm going to use an example. We're both in our 50s. We both go to the doctor. He goes to the doctor because he found something weird on his body. I go because I broke something in a fall. Statistically, in two years, if his survival with cancer is higher than my chance of survival with a broken joint. And yet, when's the last time you went to a normal gym and saw people on the ground at all? Folks, 
teaching your kids rolling and tumbling as a youth, fall breaking, whatever you guys do, fall training, really important. And at my age, I'm, with the total hip, I'm now back to doing cartwheels. And the reason I'm doing cartwheels is because I want to dance with my grandchild at her wedding. So that's why. Every other quality. Oh, so the, on the gaps is what aren't you doing? If I said anything there and you're not doing farmer walks, you're not doing deep squats like the goblet squat, you're not tumbling, that's a gap in your training. And the best way I can get you to move back up is just add. When you say we're going to have time, stop bench pressing so much and start doing farmer walks. Instead of curls, tumble. Well, Dan, when will we do bench press and curls? I don't know. Do it on your own. Every other quality comes from the actual sport you play or from the work you do. If you have to climb ladders in your job, I can't. That little ladder thing in the gym, you know that ladder thing? God bless it, it's great. Ain't nothing like climbing a ladder when there's fire dropping on you, right? Actually, if you did it in your gym, had people, that's, see, this, we could work this out, talk later, and we'll make a machine for that. We would make money on this, you know, call it fighter, fire, work, fire, fighter workout. See how it made it, yeah, there's money there. I like your heads up. So the elites can clue us in on a few things. Now, in, if I had, if I, in my longer workout, uh, workshop, I go through uh, the Finnish high jump standards, the Finnish long jump standards, uh, uh, the standards for a bunch of different elite uh, sports, including American football. But it's interesting because when you take all the standards of elite sport, <laughs> the numbers end up being right around there. For elite high jumpers, a 200-pound snatch, a 300-pound clean, and a 400-pound squat. Um, I have a point to make on this. Tom Fahey's fa uh, famous study on the discus, you need to bench four, snatch 250, clean 300, squat 450. If you could do that, you had the system needed to throw international levels. And here's the point. If you don't, ain't my fault as your strength coach. It's technical. It's something else. So what standards allow you to do, now I don't know if you guys have a standard in your gym, but I'd like you to try to get some. Because what you can then say if, here are the standards. You do the push-ups you're supposed to, you did the pull-ups you're supposed to do. You're still getting hurt on the job, or you're still, I, this sounds cruel, but ain't my fault. What's going on out there that's not allowed? So then, as, then we can focus on the out there side. You know, if you, you, you there's always that one guy who doesn't duck when you're supposed to duck. Getting his bench press up to 600 pounds ain't going to improve his ducking ability. He needs to practice other things. You got that, whatever it is. The value of this little thing is allow us to think of standards for everybody else. And this comes from last night's dinner. These are the standards that I have, and I'll go through one of them in great detail in just a few minutes. Stand on one foot is a standard you should try to maintain until the day you die. Now, this is going to be our first test when we do my assessment in just a few minutes. Uh, number two is hang from a bar for 30 seconds. I am shocked when my 20-something guys can't hang from a bar for 30 seconds. Now, they can do, like this one guy can do 15 pull-ups. But hanging from the bar like this, it doesn't expose his grip. It exposes all the problems he has here. And then uh, last night we talked about, I have this new, I just wrote an article about it. It's my new way of doing the pull-up test. And, and I really like it a lot. I'm going to share it with you. And everybody you ever give this to is going to hate it. Stop doing 10,000 pull-ups because you hang from the bar for 30 seconds. And then I say, go. You do one pull-up. You hang from the bar for 30 seconds. And I say, go. Two. So when you say you did five pull-ups in this method, pull-ups aren't your problem. Pull-ups aren't your problem. Here's a nice thing if you are testing large groups. You know, those guys, especially, you know, a lot of my friends will go in the Marine Corps and they do that Marine Corps pull-up. No offense, Marines, I love them, Semper Fi. Um, but they, they go to boot camp and they lose about 40 pounds of body weight in boot camp. 
and do pull-ups like 35 times a day, and they come back and they say, I can do 55 pull-ups. Well, yeah, if you can keep your body weight at 130 the rest of your life and do pull-ups seven times a day, you've got a chance to maintain that. But this method exposes a lot of that. The third one, standing long jump your body height. One of the signs of aging is the loss of spring, the loss of fast twitch muscles. On Friday, I'm going to the Stark Museum. You guys know Terry Todd and Jan and Terry Todd, great people. He's the one who taught me this about spring. The sign of aging, I, it's funny because it's uh, for looks at your butt, but it's also the, the butt provides spring. The two things happen together. You know, it's not much to say. You might say, well, I jump X, Y, and Z. Fine. Maintain that as long as you can. Uh, squat down. This is a very interesting one. Squat down, hold for 30 seconds, and stand up. Uh, again, everyone thinks it's simple until they do it. Uh, what it shows you is how's, how's that lower body mobility. It's interesting because hang from the bar is an upper body mobility test as much as grip strength, oddly. Okay? Farmer walk your body weight. If something bad comes down, it would be nice to be able to carry your own body weight out of the way or somebody else's. And then, of course, I'll show you the get back up test in just a few minutes when we move. Okay? I'm just throwing this slide in. These are my standards that you should strive to, to your deathbed to hold on to. And again, a lot of you who are, who are young and full of spit, uh, you're laughing at those. But trust me, sit down with your mom and dad or uncles and aunts, and you'll see, you'll see what happens. In other words, when you look at the vast population. Oh, uh, real quick before we slide into uh, the assessment. Um, even if people aren't athletes, always learn the lessons that we learn from athletes. Interesting thing, I work with a number of uh, professional teams. Um, and there's one that has to do this draw, uh, flight. They have to go from Seattle to Tampa Bay, I think it is. It's the longest flight in professional sports that still stays in the United States. You got that? And I, when I first pointed this out to the team, they're like, that's so true. I'm horizontally gifted, OK? And uh, when I fly, even in a good plane, as the flight goes on, I start to do this. Do you see what I'm, see what's happening? Remember Yonda a few minutes ago? Yonda's uh, 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 tonics? Flying does this to us. So what I recommend they do almost immediately is a hip flexor stretch as soon as they get to the hotel room and simply assess their hip flexor. So in my world, the key to the hip flexor stretch, I'm 99 and all that, is my big toe, my, okay, my, I have my left knee down, so my right big toe, my right big toe is pushing as hard as it can to hell, or China, whatever, okay? So I'm pushing hard. Now today I know, this is weird, but this is a lot tighter than it normally is. Could it have been the fact that I flew from Salt Lake City to Orlando yesterday and then couldn't get a room for four hours and then hung out with the Sornex crowd last night? Yeah, I was sitting down all day long. So today my hip flexor's tight. If we're gonna go out and throw right now, it would be worthy we take a little extra time to loosen it up. Second is T-spine. You know, you'll always see people on a plane, huh? You see people on the plane near the galley or the bathroom. They're always trying to do that. If someone's throwing a ball at your head at 98 miles an hour and you're a little stiff today, you're in trouble. Okay? And then finally, the one that really throws people off is rotary stability. And our test for rotary stability is a single side leg. It's just this one, okay? That's, that's our test. Now, if 90% of the time I can hold that, no big deal. But I get off a flight from Tampa to Tampa and I'm like, why don't we take a few minutes doing bird dogs, basic bird dogs, and then build it back up? Hey, look, it's only going to take three or four minutes. Why not do it? So remember that. Second, elite athletes, we, here's an interesting thing. Every person in this room can tense at the exact same rate. The ability to relax faster and retense is the secret of being a genetic superstar. It's not how fast you tense, it's how fast you relax. So I consciously trained my athletes in a system from Bud Winters. The book is called Relax and Win. I like the book a lot. Bud Winters, it just came out in a reprint, which is good, because it was almost $300 to buy the old copy. Uh, you guys are lucky. This thing called the internet, I don't know if you heard about it. It's really... <laughs> relax and win, 
I consciously teach my athletes to over tense and then shake it out, over tense, shake it out. And then I also put them in situations in practice where I put him on so much tension, you know, uh, we're going to do a one throw competition and I say bad things, really inappropriate things to him. I try to get inside of his head. I say things about his girlfriend. I'm just trying to, every time he stands up to throw, I stop and make him sit back down, stand up to throw, make him sit him. And then I'm going to say, if you don't throw for I'm still posting results, you know. And I just kind of get jerky at the kid. Why? Because I want the kid to go like this. Jeez. There's a, picture, there's a picture of me at the Nationals a few years ago like this. Someone said, why is such a big smile? I said, well, I knew it was about to win. Well, how'd you know you were going to win? Well, because I was throwing. It was kind of a joke, but it was true. Because I had worked so hard on relaxing that I was relaxed. I tell you, it's weird. If you smile to your opponent, they don't like that. <laughs> Number three. Some of you might be wondering why I look so sore and beat up. For the four days before I came here, both my child and my godchild decide to move into new homes. Because I'm a person of horizontal giftedness, I got volunteered to help. So for four days, and you can, you can kind of see my forearms are pretty trashed, right? So for four days, I gave my great skill set of moving boxes. Because lifting weights makes you a much better person to have around when you're moving. And if you have a child, it helps to be really big and strong. If you have good looking daughters, it really, really, really helps. And sadly, point four, and I love this, can you go? That's how I assess. And honestly, for most of you, and, and I know I'm speaking the same language, I know for firefighters, I know for SWAT teams, there's no question, can you go? That is it. That's your assessment. I don't want to hear about, no offense, I love the FMS, but if your FMS score was nine and a fire starts, you can't be sitting there going, I, I need to do my correctives. If your daughter throws up on you at midnight, you say, honey, don't you know I got a zero on the shoulder mobility test? So sometimes in life, here you go. So let's go to the assessment. Uh, this is, uh, anyone wonder what Bert looks like before the beard? Uh, <laughs> God, thank you for that picture. So, so number one, I have a very simple assessment we're about to go through. And I, and I feel like when I'm done with this, a lot of questions will be answered. And, I'm, and I'll give you some ideas how to work with the male and female population. Here's, here's I'm going to answer it right here. Males need to do more mobility work. Females need generally do more strength work. Guess what? Every guy I know will lift weights. Every woman I know will put their leg up on a thing and start stretching. Our job is to talk and get that to, to, to reverse itself. When you're doing an assessment, don't promise or claim anything. All right? You know nothing. You're just simply assessing. So this is my one, two, three, four assessment. OK? And we're going to go through it right now. Some of it is just clearances, but I think they're very important. So elite athletes teach us certain things. They teach us that there's these travel issues. Having big guys in planes, we have these travel issues. Interesting, because Yonda told us that with injury, illness, or age, those are the muscles that tighten up. And once again, that's what happens as we age. We need to stretch those. Paul Anderson famously said, the guy with the biggest butt lifts the biggest weights. Yonder predicted that. These are the muscles that weaken with age. The butt, the deltoids, the triceps, and the ab wall. Best ab exercise I know is vomiting. If you've ever had a good <laughs> night of vomiting, you wake up the next day, they are not, my knock on crunches isn't, isn't crunches. It's the fact that you're training this fast twitch muscle. You, you follow? Um, another way to think of the tonics is if a tiger was chasing you and you had to hold on to a tree for a long time, you'd want, you'd want those to tighten up. But if you're out chasing a squirrel, trying to eat at dinner and hit it with a rock, you'd want the phasics. It's interesting in the tradition, and Tommy Pono gave us this Reg Park, they used to guess that around 25 reps, you'll, you'll notice that all the traditional greats, the pre-anabolic guys, always did 15 to 25 reps in most exercises. 
the LORM's great research. It comes to us as a three, three set to eight. Um, God, I tell you, Jonas Salk, I think, is a saint. You know, he, 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 never, he never patented the Salk vaccine so that we could all be polio-free. That's a beautiful thing. The LORM worked with uh, the guys hurt from World War II and the polio victims. And if you haven't read the book Progressive Resistance Exercise, you don't really know the history of our, of, of our field. You don't. It's, it's a marvelous book. Here's the sad thing. You're going to look at that book and say, wait, all these guys who said they invented stuff? Except the Goblet Squad. That guy's cool. Me. OK, assessment test number one. Can you stand on one foot for 10 seconds? What's weird about this? Just, I had a necrotic hip. I had no blood supply to my leg. I couldn't stand on this leg for 10 seconds. That's fine. I couldn't stand on this leg for 10 seconds. Why? There was something wrong with me. We couldn't cure it by looking out one eye and swinging up. The, there was something wrong with me. One of my good friends didn't tell me, but she had MS. She wanted to work out and look good, but she has MS. God bless her. She can't stand on one foot. Why? She has MS. Years ago, 1991, this very man who's very wealthy in Salt Lake, I was training him, he couldn't stand on one foot and his ankle hurt. And I said, why? Just step off a curb? He said, no, I don't know. We sent it to a doctor. He had prostate cancer. Now, why does prostate cancer on this? I don't know. But I've had, this is a universal truth that I've stolen from very quality people. If the person can't stand on one foot, send them off to get to see a medical doctor. Why? I don't know. But it's interesting, the more people start doing this, how long does this test take? It takes 10 seconds. So, well, I, I, we only do one foot. Oh, here's another cool thing about this test. People start practicing it in your gym. <laughs> I'll show you. And after 20 seconds, there's no value to this test at all. But I'll see people staying up like three and a half minutes, just trying to, you know. Hey, that's great. Anytime people are trying to steal a, you know, trick a test, God bless them, that's great. This test is clearance. Hey, does anyone know what time I go to? Is it 11.10? Yes. Boy, we're in great shape, good. If they pass the test, fine, keep assessing. If they fail, I want you to refer out. Here's the thing, I know you guys are all, those of you who you know, kick doors down and stuff, you're all macho and stuff, but if something like this shows up, let's take care of it. Go see a medical doctor. That's test number one, the one foot test. Then I have two measurements. The two measurements, by the way, uh, ladies, you want to train in my gym. My scale only measures one thing. Do you weigh over 300 pounds? <laughs> Anything under 300, we're fine. According to the research we have now, once you get over 300, the numbers, the statistics start really help hitting big. If you weigh over 300 pounds, this is a clearance test. By the way, it's male or female. And females all the time say, well, that's awfully heavy. You know, I know. Remember, only 14 to 16% of Americans have gym memberships or, or exercise at all. We have about 84% of our population we're not touching. Uh, yeah, we're here in Orlando. I don't want to be the guy who says this because this is inappropriate. But I guarantee if you went to one of the parks and just sat there and watched humanity walk by, I've said this many times. If your spouse leaves, you're feeling terrible about yourself. Sit on a chair in Las Vegas for 20 minutes and just do this. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing okay. You know? <laughs> I didn't say that. If you're over 300, I insist on three tests. First is the eye doctor. You should all be going to the eye doctor once a year. Before I had my total hip, my doctor, who I've known a long time, he kind of leaned back as he's looking at my eyes, like, hmm. And he's a friend, so he's trying to do that whole, I'm a professional, but I'm freaking out thing. I guess my blood pressure was through the roof. An eye doctor can see high blood pressure. They can see arteries moving. It's the only profession that can see. They can also see diabetes. So when you go to an eye doctor, not only do they check you for your eyesight, which is important, but they also have this ability to tell you what's going on in your cardiovascular system. 
with just looking in. They can see diabetes, which amazes me. They can see cholesterol building up. Interesting thing, two years after I, I, I got the total hip, he says, I can't believe the difference that getting you out of pain has done for your cardiovascular health. I, I mean, it's, this is just one doctor's opinion. Number two, and this is an interesting one, dentist. Hey, we all, right? Hey, hi, I'm Dan John, fat loss professional. You need to eat more vegetables. Well, if Edna has, needs a total crown and has seven cavities, you tell her to eat carrots? It's not that she doesn't want to. She physically cannot do it. Stunning insight from my doctor, Dr. Seth Spangler. I said to him, do you see many uh, obese patients? He goes, no, I never see them. So I went to the, uh, the ADA website and looked up obesity. They have their, their recommendation is get wider chairs. Ask your dentist if you go, how often do you see overweight patients? They'll say, rarely. Now, this is the question for all of you, and I want you to think about it with all your clients and all your people. Is it a chicken or the egg question? Does bad teeth lead to obesity, or does obesity lead to bad teeth? I don't know. But I know this, in 100 years, they're going to laugh at us. Like, we laugh at people back, well, if you just took a bath, you wouldn't get the black death, you know, or whatever we say. Eat more protein, whatever. They will say, lack of dental care and lack of sleep was the obesity epidemic. That's what I think. We're sleeping less and less and less. And I know we eat a lot of sugar. I get all that. But if we take care of our teeth and get more sleep, I think things will turn. And then finally, when they go to the medical doctor, they'll be like, I know, I know, I've heard this before. I know I've got high blood pressure. I know. Because it takes those three visits. And if they don't want to do it, do you really want <laughs> my favorite thing of all time? I always put heart rate monitors on people when I train them. And then I have someone like Parker, he's one of my interns. They'll stand behind with the thing like this. Stoney weighed 350 pounds when he first came to train with me. He did one, two, three presses, and Parker went. His heart rate after three presses was 174 and going up. You really want to train that 300 pound client without at least getting a look see? I've never killed a client or an athlete. Now, I've won. I, I, I mean, let's be honest, I wanted to kill many of them, but. This is a clearance test. And now we start with the actual assessment. If they can't do this, they weigh over 300, we don't start. But now we start this test. This is the height to waist ratio. Height to waist. If I double this measurement, I should be that tall. OK? I have to grow a little bit taller to make this work, but don't worry, I'm working on it. I stretch every night. This is hard to explain, so let me give you some examples. If you're 72 inches tall, male or female, your waistline should be 36 inches. Now, Greg O'Gallagher recommends even more. He says 34. I don't think I've had a 34 inch waistline since the first time he did a clean and jerk. But uh, so if you're 64 inches tall, 32, 68 inches tall, 33. These are all problematic waistlines. Here's the funny thing, folks. This is the most important test I take. The bulk of the clients I work with, young men especially, are failing this test more and more and more. We're talking high school kids. So this starts with how to apply this. And this is my Venn diagram. So the mobility issues will be ones. The body comps are three. And the strengths are five. Uh, Seven means you failed all the failed. You did not pass all three tests, OK? Twos mean you had a mobility issue and a body comp issue. Fours, uh, men, OK? Fours mean you have a strength issue and a body comp issue. Women. And here's the secret. This is how I train off-season athletes and special, special guys. I train them as sixes, no matter what they are. Oh, you know, almost universally, you know. Uh, when I'm working with an NFL lineman, yeah, God bless Gray. Gray snapped the ball to uh, Brett Favre, uh, Dan Marino, Tom Brady. has three Super Bowl rings. And, you know, he would lighten up in the offseason to 315 pounds. That's when he was skinny. Well, we're not worried about his waistline. So we train him uh, as a six, which is combining strength work with mobility. So. If I could give you one thing to take away today, 
whenever you're working with somebody who's in a collision occupation, uh, firefighter, SWAT, whatever, strength, mobility, strength, mobility, our rest periods are mobility work. So there is no rest in my gym. No one rests. You just move on to mobility work. So you're, and here's the interesting thing. Bird dogs raise your heart rate. Mobility work for most men raises the heart rate. So you get your cardio in by stretching. Next, I move to three questions. Question number one is the one I'm gonna get pushed back on the rest of my career. I'm right, you're wrong. No one's ever lied to me about this. How many pillows does it take for you to sleep comfortably at night? And there's gonna be a woman here going, this is not true, I, need, I don't really need three pillows. I just like it, very comfortable. I don't. If your answer is one, we move on. More than one, you are a mobility client. And I'll get hands go up. Well, I do Bikram 17 times a week. Right. Ah, uh, see the hands go up. See, <laughs> yes, sir. Well, then that's one and less, that's fine. Yeah. I like to sleep on a bed of nails covered by rattlesnakes. <laughs> but not, not big rattlesnakes, you know, medium size, yeah, western, so diamond back. Yeah, and I like to choke, yeah, I, and I drink their venom for breakfast, that's what I, okay, I gotta tell you, man, this one, this, I, I guarantee there's gonna be someone coming up after, hey man, you know, this. last weekend I put this up there, and this guy, okay, so we have, one of my good friends is, is a doctor, and she puts him through, so we did the FMS screen on him, he zeroes on two places. Okay, you guys know if you do FMS zero, that's not passing, it means you're in pain. He can't, he can't do this. He can't do this. I'm a discus, I mean, yeah, all the discus throwers are going, I've been through for 45 years, I can do this. Then she does that thing called the SFMA on him, and he is just a wreck. And then he walks up and goes, yeah, I don't agree with what she said. Okay, so. You just had a doctor walking through the FMS, the SFMA, telling you you're jacked up and everything you do hurts, but you're fine. Yeah. And so I just take the wall and I start slamming my head against it until it starts to make sense. Folks, this is a tough one. So, now, here's the funny thing. When I'm at home, I sleep with one pillow. When I get off these flights, one, two, three. Why, what happens when I fly? My hip flexors tighten up, I lose my T-spine, well, I lose my rotary stability too. But if I'm tight here and tight here, then I put a pillow between my knees, you, you, you guys fall? So I get this wonderful chance weekly to see myself swim from one to three. So if you fail this, you are in this area. Here's the interesting thing. I'm trying to work with this guy last week, trying to convince him that he's, he's the only absolute one I've ever met in my life. He was strong, he was very strong, very lean. Uh, figured out later on, I've, he was probably on a massive amounts of ephedrine. That's the only way you can explain the behavior. Uh, and you need to, you know, stretch out your faces and quit doing so much X, Y, and Z. You can't hear me. Why? This is male. Telling males they need to do mobility work is the hardest thing I do, so I have a way around it. The next two questions are simply for listening. These will help later. Now, this workshop, I mean, this today I don't have enough time for this, but I also classify people who come to me into five categories. D-trained, which is the worst. That's I used to coulda. That's high school, coach hated me, I should play in the NFL. I bench 500 pounds, ran a 4140. Guys, this tall. Used to coulda, well, when I was in high school, I was a cheerleader. You guys get these clients? Yeah, no matter what you say, yeah. The one female who told me that she had done 30 diets in her life, she, I couldn't teach her anything. The best are untrained. Wow, what is this called? It's called a kettlebell. Wow, it's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Overconditioned and undertrained, these are people that always like to vomit in the bucket, and they can't, uh, the, everything they do is ugly to look at. And there's a lot of them now. The bulk are dazed and confused. All right, all right, all right. 
So I read on the internet that uh, protein's bad for you. Wait, no, it's carbs or fat. Well, yeah, they're all bad for you. So what, if I can't eat protein, carbs, or fat, what should I eat? And you shouldn't drink water because it's got pesticides or metal or, yeah. That's your client right now. That's 99% of your clients. So I heard weightlifting makes you muscle bound. And the research doesn't say that. Well, yeah, but my mom said so. And of course, that glorious client, if you could ever get them, those seeking mastery. <gasps> oh, I've never had one. <laughs> Question two. These two questions are not on the Venn diagram. These are just to get behind the curtain here a little bit. Do you eat colorful vegetables? Originally it was, do you eat vegetables? <coughs> Potato chips and Fritos are vegetables, you see? So we had to back off on that one. Colorful vegetables. Here's what you want to hear. If they say, oh yes, absolutely, and they weigh 350, I now know that I got an A, not A client. There's someone telling me what they think I want to hear. You guys following that, how important that line? And now here's the thing, they say, hell no, I'll make it. Vegetables over here. And they get this look of disgust and anger on their face. Now, you want that client. Because when you go away for two weeks and you, do you say, Did you work out? Yeah. Guess what they're doing? They're telling you the truth. So you just have to practice listening. And the next question is an interesting one, too. Do you exercise for at least half an hour a day? Because if they're eating colorful vegetables and training half an hour a day and they're morbidly obese and can't walk, See that disconnect? By the way, elite athletes don't train half an hour a day. They take days off. You know, go to an NFL team on Monday, they're nowhere around. Okay, so you follow? So what you're trying to do is get behind the veil. If they answer yes to both questions, it allows you later, when trying to talk to them about what they need to do, you'll have a way to get around that. You follow? Remember, you know, we go on our first date. I'm gonna tell you, if you say you like Flossing, I'm really, yeah, man, I'm a floss. I love flossing. No matter what she says early in a relationship, right? We're gonna, I'm gonna agree, right? So we're early in a relationship. I say, hey, I want you to drink 23 protein shakes a day, and I want you to drink two buckets of Metamucil on the hour, every hour. Oh yeah, man, right on. That sounds good. I can. Do it's not true. It's not gonna happen. When I do, when I get people first, my first thing is. I want you to drink two glasses of water a day. And if I'm your accountability buddy, I call you up nine o'clock at night, say, did you drink two glasses? And I'll hear this, oh heck, I forgot. Most of your clients can't drink two glasses of water a day. And yet they think though, that they, you can put me on the Spartan regimen and I'm gonna go kill a wolf. And then now comes the part that I find most interesting. Uh, am I doing on time still? I'm sorry to be that guy. 15 minutes, we're in great shape. Do you guys feel, I hope you feel like you've learned something, okay? Yeah, you actually have 20. Yeah, I personally would, could listen to myself all day. <laughs> okay. It's so simple, I get this from my friend Stu McGill. Now, at our gym, we do the push-up position plank, uh, but this plank is fine. Uh, I like to plank on one hand with the feet in the air for two minutes. That's what I like to do. Can you hold a plank for two minutes? And someone's going to raise their hand. What if the person shakes? That's yeah, fine. What if their stomach, stomach? I don't care. Here's the thing. Here's how to make everyone fail the test the first time. Say go. And don't say another word until 59 seconds. And then say halfway. And you look around. <laughs> According to my good friend, Stu McGill, and you know he's my good friend because I said that, he says either, and that's why I love Stu, either, if you fail this test, either you're obese or you're lazy. So it kind of summarizes it pretty well, I think. So on the Venn diagram, this gives us a look-see into this. If they can't hold the plank for two minutes, they are a strength client. Why am I going with such simple tests so fast? Because we've got to get to our, by the way, how long does this one, two, three, four assessment take? It, it takes about five or six minutes at the most. But the, it's given us a chance to figure out instantly how to program this person. You got that? 
And that's the problem we have. Someone comes back wrecked from the field, my job is to get them going again. So what are we gonna do the next nine days? The next three days? Heck, that day is pretty good, okay? If they fail the plank, stop assessing. Okay, these are pictures from my backyard when people failed the plank, that, these are pretty good. You stop, if they fail the plank, you stop. Now, a lot of you I know want the other three tests, and the other three tests have great value. The other three tests are this. After the plank, do some form of the get up test. Now, I'm gonna show you the Brazilian one. If you go to my website, danjohn.net, I have a, 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 a thing called three longevity tests. And on there, I, there, there's a YouTube of the Dr. Ar Arulha in uh, Brazil, and he goes through the get back up test. Honestly, I think it's about a 45 minute explanation, but let me show you how to do the test. Get down on the ground, get back up. Good, that's the whole test, but he goes over it in detail. Uh, you can tell the Irish in me by the fact that I couldn't watch the whole thing. So I'm gonna show you the get back up test in just a second, okay? But I have another test for you guys Hey, can I, is someone in, can I just borrow you for five seconds? Uh, you're, you're in sweat, so, yeah. So let me just show you the test. Um, okay, watch how I do this, okay. I want you to get on your belly. Get back up. Uh, get on your right side for me. Get back up. Get on your left side for me. Get back up. Push up position plank. Get back up on your back, get back up, good. So those are the five basics, okay? Now you st stay with me, stay with me. So your right hand can be stuck to your right knee, glued. If it comes off, a puppy dies, okay? <laughs> so let's do this, uh, push up position plank. So I would do all five of those basics, just for time, I'm just, uh, get back up, good. Uh, hand on left knee, uh, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> on your back, on, just get on your back. And get back up. When people ask how I work abs, that's how I do. See how I just did a kind of a sit up? Good, uh, hands off. Take your right hand, put it on the left knee. But you do you do belly, right, left, uh, push up, back with every one of them, okay? Right hand, left knee. Thanks for doing this, by the way, we appreciate it. Uh, let's go on your belly. No, no, uh, sorry. Uh, on, lay on your belly. Oh, no, no, no. Hand is glued. Now, get on your belly. Get back up. Good, it's off. Uh, left hand, right knee. Uh, let's go on your uh, left side. Can you see how he's thinking? See, most 58-year-olds, when you say get on the ground, they do this. <laughs> it's all the way down there, get back up. So, I just gave you, if we, thanks, good, stay, stay, stay. So, if you do, on your belly, right side, left side, push up position, plank, all those, that gives you 25 get back ups. Let me show you two other variations that I would use with your population. Both hands behind your neck. Uh, push up position plank. <laughs> nice, okay, good, get back up. And now, this fun variation, this is an advanced one. Put your hands in, yeah, put both hands on your, uh, on your own buttocks. You have to clear that up when you work with certain parts of the military. <laughs> It's a little weird. Okay, uh, let's have you go on your belly. And get back up. See this? So if you're working with, thanks, perfect. Thanks so much for doing that, I really appreciate it. Hey, you gotta have great respect for someone who just steps up and, you know, that's, thank you so much, that's, that's hard to do. Um, so I just gave you, uh, what, 35, very, you know, 35 movements. It's a great warm up. It gets people up and down. Okay, just just kind of remember that. The other two tests are the standing long jump. Um, uh, okay, I'm six foot, so I should jump six foot. But to be an elite discus thrower, I should jump nine. If I'm jumping six, my problem is somewhere between six and nine feet. You follow? Now, if I can't, and we start doing deadlifts, and all of a sudden my standing long jump improves. Deadlifts are helping, you, you follow that? So this also helps us test the program. I used to use a million tests, now I only use two. I have a thousand tests. I've done everything you guys have. I've stolen you guys blind for years. These are my two real tests. 
And the other one is the farmer walk. I used to get a lot more fancy, but you just can't do, I have farmer bars, you don't. Someone weighed 209 pounds one time, and we are sitting there trying to figure out how to get half of 209 pounds in each hand. Well, I just stood there going, we're, just get, we're getting stupider as we stay in here. So here's the policy we use now. We use a trap bar. If you're under 135, 135, 135 to 185, 185, 185 to 205, 205, and everybody over 205 uses 255. The standard we have is a 100, meter, uh, 100 yard walk. 50 and 50. If you can, okay, so I put you on a program like my 14 day mass made simple. At the end of the 14 days, you, you put on 40 pounds body weight. Oh, that's pretty good. You lose two inches off your uh, standing long jump. But your farmer walk went from 100 feet to 195 feet, yards. Did the program work? Well, yeah, you lost a little bit off your standing long jump, but it's if you're a football player, you're not gonna get smaller during the game. You follow? So these two tests, the standing long jump and the uh, farmer walk test, allow me to measure the program a little bit. Listen, I'm measuring the athlete, but I'm using the information to measure what we've been doing. Follow? Nobody, by the way, nobody does it. Nobody. So this is the get, get up test from Brazil. Um, if you get up and down like this, God bless you. <laughs> I couldn't have done this as, as a 12 year old. But you cross your legs, you don't touch. And then you lose a point for your hand. Um, because of total hip, uh, I've got this thing in my pocket, but I always have to put my hand down for the test, okay? But that means I'm an eight. Statistically, it means I got about another 20 years in me, which would be awesome. Because my mom and dad both died before my. Not only is it a good test, but these make a pretty good program if you think about it. That little thing we just, what's your first name, sir? Luke. Luke. I read your book. Thank you. A little theology humor. <laughs> if you do, like if you're using kettlebells and you do Turkish get-ups, you cover the get-back or you have, do what Luke did, the get-back-up test. To train the standing long jump and use a kettlebell, you, you do swings. That's, by the way, if you don't like swings, go to a, tr a typical track and do standing long jumps all the way around. Okay, it's something I like to do. I like to go for a mile doing nothing but standing long jumps. <laughs> yeah, my record right now is four minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, good, you fit, good, you knew I'm lying, that's good. I worry about Bruce. Farmer, farmer walk test, you would, uh, in my language, suitcase carries one hand, one hand here like a suitcase. Waiter walk is like this. By the way, so I'm trying to show you, if you only had one kettlebell or one dumbbell, you can do all this stuff. You got that? And of course, for the two minute plank test, you can either do push ups, pups, or push up position planks, okay? Uh, and then I got the goblet squat in the middle. If you just decided to, <laughs> if you had a big gym and only one bell for everybody, that's how I train people when there's only one bell, or one medicine ball for everybody. Um, 113 kids at once, man, it's something to behold. Me and 113 athletes at once. It's, it's amazing, uh, plan. How am I doing on time, man? Oh, shit, I'm doing All right. You guys don't have these slides. We will make sure somehow we give them to you, okay? All right? Uh, is this, I hope you're still picking up stuff. One of the things, since I have 10 minutes, I can uh, go on for just a second. I think the least important thing you have in your gym is equipment. Because sometimes we have to, everything changes. So if I have nothing but hammer equipment, and then I have to go to a place that has a beach, I can't bring that hammer equipment to the beach, you follow? So I always look at equipment a little differently than most people. Now, I, gotta, I love equipment. And everything they have out there for sale is fantastic. Having said that, there are times a lot of my workouts are based, like the Bulgarian goat bag swing and some other stuff, is based on training with an ammo can. Okay? Because if that's all you have, or a rock, that's what you train with. You follow? So sometimes we have to be smart enough that we're movement first, and equipment's a nice thing to have. But trust me, it's a nice thing to have. Though with our new system of the... Uh, the ladder and the fire being poured on them. I like where that. I like where our head's at. 
Talk about fat loss program, the adrenal rush alone. It's like swimming with sharks. You know, you don't have to swim far because you burn fat, you know. And don't worry about elimination. <laughs> what I strive for is mastery. This is uh, one of my heroes from my youth, Dave Emery, uh, 400 meter champion, uh, intermediate hurdles. He took pen and paper and figured out, like Roger Bannister figured out the four minute mile, he took pen and paper and figured out what he had to do to be the Olympic champion. And to me, I love that. When we apply this before we apply this. I, I like that. And you'll notice there's one, there's the highs and lows of daily, weekly, monthly, and decadely training. I'm going through a personal crisis right now. It, it, we're fine, it's not me, I'm helping somebody. But I have to acknowledge right now to you that someone in my life is hurting. So when someone in my life is hurting, I have to realize that's gonna impact how I teach, it's gonna impact how I coach, and it's impact my workout today. You follow? It's called life. We have to put our arms around that. You, you got that? Okay? Your athletes, your, the people you work with, have these things called lives. And sometimes they interfere with what we wanna do in the weight room. Okay, we're almost done, okay? Um, to help with mastery, I use this I use this diagram. So what I've done for your client, what I've done is I put them in one of seven categories. Good question. If the person passes all the tests, I train them as a six still. Six is the fallback. Here's the key. I can't pound this into you enough. It's not what the client wants to do, it's what the client needs to do. Now, let me give you some tips on how to talk with any client. Well, that's a whole uh, another 600 hours. Real quick, the bulk of the normal American population is in the threes. In the threes, that is mobility, uh, uh, body composition clients. They need some kind of caloric restriction, and they need some kind of what we call inefficient exercise. The biggest problem we'll have, uh, any of you, uh, I'm Irish, so naturally we're the best dancers in the world, but is anyone not a good dancer in here? Okay, young man, thanks for your candor. You would do great in a Zumba class. Because when teacher says step ball change, you'd be going, and the girl next to you go, fat loss for him, because he's not very good at it. Not fat loss for her. If you're a good swimmer, don't swim. If you're a lousy biker, bike. You got that? My bike weighs 90 pounds. If you do a, a century on that thing, you will have had a workout. Trust me, it also holds about 24 beers, so you're, uh, you'll, you'll keep hydrated. Dan, what are you drinking? Water. Oh, I thought you were hydrating. Other phrase I hate, I hate the word hydration. I hate cardio, I hate hydration. It's water! Your females will be fours, your gentlemen will be twos, and really the bulk of your clients, honestly, probably sevens in the normal population. So, and then uh, reassess uh, really simply. Uh, people ask me how often to do the one, two, three, four assessment. We did it in, um, I had a surgery. <laughs> That's my life story. For me to say I had a surgery is like you guys saying, oh, I went to a Christmas party. It's just something I like to do. Every so often I'm like, hey, will you pour some chemicals into my body and then cut me open? So uh, after we did it, I, I, I did the one, two, three, four assessment, and shockingly, I'm an absolutely pure three. So when you see me in the gym doing something other than inefficient movements, the kettlebell swing is extremely inefficient. You work really hard and go nowhere. Okay, you follow? If you see me doing anything besides kettlebell swings or mobility work, you have to say, hmm, Dan, what was your assessment again? Uh, uh, the standing long jump takes about a minute and a half to do all three jumps. The farmer walk test is a great workout, too. Um, and then these are the numbers. Anytime I see your standing long jump and your farmer walk both go up, I feel like we've done some good things in your training. If the standing long jump drops off a foot and a half, we got to talk about what was the value to that. Like, for example, maybe you're in off season doing a lot of mobility. That's fine. But we better bring that back up. For most of us, it's going to be stretch what is tightening, strengthen what is weakening, <laughs> eat like an adult. I'd like to add adjectives uh, right before adult. <laughs> B 
build in cardio. I build in cardio. How do I know I have cardio in my workouts? Because we have heart rate monitors on. So as uh, I use Matthew Tone's number, I'm, uh, so it's 180 minus my age. And I love that number. So I want to be around, I want to be from 103 to 123 beats a minute while I train. If I'm strength training and doing my mobility, I stay in there the entire workout. Strength, mobility, strength, mobility, strength, mobility, strength, mobility, strength, mobility. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And of course, seek mastery. The value of this assessment is simply this. It gives you an insight into now what? If there is a problem being a coach, it's the phrase, now what? I have been on the bus when we have, uh, as a head coach, where we have lost in an upset that cost us a chance to go to state championship. I'm dad on that bus, and I gotta tell you, man, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I've seen a kid throw three discus throws outside the sector in the trials at the state meet. You've probably seen this. Kid was, should have been the state champion. Dad comes over, what are you gonna say, coach? Now what? Hardest part of, what this one, two, three, four assessment does for you is that you can say to this client, hey, we're gonna do mobility work. I know you love doing X, Y, and Z, but we're gonna do mobility work between that. See what I just did for him? For you, I know you love A, B, and C, but you know what, I wanna, there's a thing called a deadlift and a thing called a pull-up. I wanna teach you that, okay? See how he did that? It allowed the now, it allowed me to fix things. So here's that diagram again. I think all of you are familiar with it, right? And now the answers, the answer key. Just, just, just the cheat sheet, but don't worry, the next slide will be the one we'll talk about. I have basically four tools. There's a fifth one called mental set. I don't have time for mental set. Oh, I got five. I might. I might give you one or two quick hints on training up here. Just, is that okay? I hope you guys learned something. And I hope you guys realize that I might not be scientific, but I work hard on this stuff. There's only four tools, and the tools are hypertrophy and mobility training. I always combine the stretching of the pec with strengthening the deltoid. If we're working the glute, if I'm doing swings, working the glute, our rest is hip flexor stretches. You follow how this works? So you combine the two, as, as Yonda taught us, is what we're trying to do is going You follow? So by building one side and stretching the other, both work. The second tool, of course, nutrition and caloric restriction. The third is inefficient exercise. That's swings or uh, throw someone who doesn't know how to swim into a pool of sharks. They'll learn how to swim. And the last one is strength training. So what this chart does, <laughs> here's the problem with sevens. They need everything. So what do you do? You have them drink two glasses of water tonight. Okay, that's, for those of you, most of you here, I'd, I'd like to think you guys are sixes. I'd like you to do some strength training and combine your hypertrophy and mobility training. And so, to make it even simpler, I did this for you, okay? So, the bulk of your clients are in the three circle, so let's get started there. Your threes need nutrition and caloric restriction of some kind. The answer to caloric restriction is this. We have a little contest, and I did it again yesterday, it was hard. By the way, I ordered a sweet potato. I, I've got to remind myself I'm in the South. It, where I come from, a sweet potato is a vegetable. Down here, it's a dessert. I have to just kind of, I've never seen so much sugar on it. It has more sugar than a donut. I didn't know that. So, you know, at our gym, we just try, we would like you to eat eight different kinds of vegetables a day. It's this weird little thing. I didn't say eight servings. <laughs> no one's gonna do that, none of my guys. They'll beat me up. But if you have a little bit of onion, a little bit of pepper, you follow? That one thing, the other thing is to drink a gallon of water a day. Uh, that's a tough one. And right now I could really use that. Um, and then an inefficient exercise. For me, if you see me train, swing, uh, I do 25 swings, one goblet squat, march in place, and then a TRX stretch. And I'm not selling them. Because they never, pr they promise me stuff and never deliver. <laughs> oh, I, Chris, I didn't see you here. If, most gentlemen are twos. Now, it looks like there's a lot there, but if you combine uh, basic bodybuilding training for the deltoids, the triceps, and the butt, and stretch between, and then do some swings, you've pretty much covered it. You got that? And tell Bob, Bob, eat your vegetables. And if he says bad words to you, call me and I'll deal with it. For, for most ladies, 
they need to. They love it. They'll do the swings because they'll get sweaty. They'll love that. And then have them do deadlifts and pull-ups. According to my good friend Josh Hillis, my God, I love his work. A woman is universally rock star hot when she can do three pull-ups, three dips, and either deadlift or squat 135 for five. And some of you are sitting here going, those numbers aren't very big. Shut up. <laughs> you shut up. It's weird because they get their body composition goals and can maintain it at those levels of strength. But most of the women want to, you know, I, what I'd like to just do is sweat. Okay, you want to sweat? I've got this thing in my house called a sauna. I can stick you in there. I can hammer the door shut. I'll get the sweat. It can, my, my home sauna can get up to 210 degrees. I'll get the water out of you. I might kill you, but you'll look good. What helps most women is strength, getting stronger. And then all your dreams come true. And then, of course, we still have the seven issue, and that's a tough one, okay? So in the last few seconds, here's mental set for you real quick. The fifth tool is mental set. And think of it as a, are you guys okay with if I add this extra two? It's a check mark. It's a check mark. It's, it's, the, it's a black swan. Most people think that they have a big lever I can push. And that lever is pain. The best client you could ever have in your life is a recently divorced woman whose husband has left her for another woman. And there's a 20 year high school reunion coming up. And they're all gonna be there. Why? Because every time Edna doesn't wanna do, I say, hey, uh, I saw Bob, your ex. His girlfriend's hot. <laughs> put, that, put that shoe on her neck. Yeah? But sadly, pain doesn't. Everyone thinks, uh, I wouldn't want to mention Mike Pekowski's name, but uh, years ago I'm at Denny's with Mike and, he, and, I, and we're doing this pain pleasure chart and I go, well, why do you want to make the Olympic team? And I swear, God bless Mike, he goes, that'd be cool. <laughs> so I couldn't, you can't use that lever. The second one is prison. By the way, it's four Ps, just get you ready for it. The second one is prison. The best diet plan I know is Tom Hanks uh, for the movie Castaway. I'm gonna stick you on an island for four plus years. You have to learn to make fire so you can eat crab besides coconut. It works. Seriously, folks. Time. Sadly, we're not allowed to put fat loss patients anymore into prison. Uh, I know, it's like, wow, what a good idea. The third is pound, uh, the third, so it's pain, wonderful. Prison, that's so great. I can't do it. Pound the pavement. BJ Fogg, F-O-G-G, -G, has a site called Tiny Habit. Please, please go. And I'd like you all to sign up for his Tiny Habit program. Most people have to take baby steps to a habit. When I first started coaching, I used to think that my athletes were just like me. I was wrong. What you have to do is slowly get them now to commit. So with tiny habits, there's this. I drink that glass of water. I smile and I go, yes. Up oh, you, Dan John. I drank my glass of water. It's the oddest thing in the world. He argues you don't floss all your teeth every day. You floss one tooth. Why? Because you're not flossing now. And his idea that most of us, the bulk of us, are step by step by step by step. Here's the problem. Every client you have thinks that they have the discipline of a monk. And by the time they walk out that door, they've already forgotten everything you said. So we have gone in my school, my group, to tiny habits as best we can. Because that's what works universally. The most important thing, the most important thing you do for a client the first day is try to get them back the second day. That's the key. Hey folks, I hope you don't mind me adding some extra slides for clarity today. Uh, I, if it was confusing at all, I apologize, but I, I tried real hard to clean up from our conversations in the last day or so. Uh, for those who came in late, Dan at danjohn.net, and my phone number is 801-288-9180. You're more than welcome to call me or email me anytime. This, a lot of this comes out in my next book called Can You Go? I'm not here selling books, trust me. I'm, ask Laria, I'm the worst salesman she's ever had. But I am honored to be here. I hope you guys know that uh, 
when you guys started uh, the NSCA, um, I was still in college, and I use a lot of your materials. Your founder wrote a book called Conditioning for a Purpose that I read my senior year in high school for the US Army pamphlet. And it told me I should do power cleans, and that pamphlet literally changed my life. So I have a great debt to this organization. And thank you so much. I'll be here all day to answer any questions.